Are you, uh, are you familiar with the phrase um, big data? Have you heard that? Big, big data um, refers to the organizations or the people, the companies that collect information about us in order to package it together and then sell it to different companies that will use it in order to market their products directly to what we're looking for. Um, and if you dig into this at all, like it's, it's almost a little difficult not to get paranoid at some level. Like this has happened a couple of times now, and maybe it's coincidence, maybe not, but I, I feel like there's been a few times now where Sherry and I have just been talking about something, kind of whatever, in a living room, just talking about like, oh, we'd love to go visit this place or, or go on vacation here or something. And then as soon as I go on like social media, it's like, there it is, right? It's like they're listening to us, right, all the time. There's been like multiple times in our home when I have said like, hey, Sherry, like asking like where my wallet is or something. And then Siri on my phone says, how can I help you? You know, like, I'm like, well, do you know where my wallet is by any chance? Like, like, and it's interesting because when you look at this and you research this, Big data has thousands of points of information on each individual person. Through our digital footprint and all of that that we leave, there's, there's thousands of points of information about what we like, about what we dislike, about, about where we experience joy and what makes us fearful and all of it is, is collected and put together and sold to people so that they can sell stuff to us. And as I was processing this this week, it, it got me asking the question, what, what do they know about me? Like if, if I were to get a report from, from one of these companies, what would that say about me? What would their information say about what I value or how I spend my time and my energy and my money? What, what would it say about my own joys and my own fears? What would it say, what would I identify if you looked at their points of data about what I prioritize most in my life? How, how does all of that reflect on me? What would it say about you? What would the information tell us about you? So I was thinking about this as I was preparing to teach this week on this, this discipline that we're looking at this morning on, on seeking, which is, is really just sort of a concise way to, to express the words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew and his Sermon on the Mount when he instructs his disciples, his followers, saying, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. But what, what does that mean? What does that look like? And, and how do we do this? How do we experience this as a spiritual discipline in our life that leads us into a fuller and deeper understanding of grace? As all of these disciplines that we've been talking about are, are intended to do. So what I want us to, to explore this morning for, for a little bit is just to look at these words of Jesus and to really try to spend some time thinking about the implications of what Jesus is instructing, what he's teaching these people who are sitting there trying to learn what it means to be his apprentice. So turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. This is in Matthew chapter six. I'm gonna, I'm gonna back up just a little bit from those words of Jesus and then we'll, we'll try to unpack what Jesus is teaching us here. This is in verse 31. Jesus says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So in verse 31 and 32, we, we give just a, a small glimpse of the context that Jesus is speaking into. This, this flows out of a conversation that he's having where he's addressing the issue of our anxieties, where, where those things that the people who are sitting there listening to Jesus teach on, what they were experiencing in terms of anxiousness in their own life, legitimate, reasonable things, 
Like, where is my next meal going to come from? Or, or will I be able to clothe my family? And in the midst of that, Jesus, in, in just a few short words, seeks to just entirely reorient the pursuit of their hearts. And he does so for us as well. I want us to consider the, the impact of Jesus teaching here today by processing a couple of questions together this morning. First, I want to begin by looking at what does it mean to seek? So, so really just understanding what that looks like. And then I want us to think about what we're seeking. And then finally, just spending some time being practical and talking about how we do this. What, what, how do we experience this in our lives? So what does it mean to seek? What are we seeking and how do we seek? So let's begin with that first question. What does it mean to seek? Of course, I think we are all very familiar with the idea of, of looking for something, right? But Jesus' words here, this imperative that he leaves with, with those listening to him teach, it seems to be more directive than this. Um, one of the things I, I love to do when Sherry and I are taking a road trip and did this when we were driving down to South Carolina just a few weeks ago, for whatever, I, I kind of get like honed in on the GPS. Like I love to, I, it, pretty much if I'm driving anywhere outside of like the Tri-Cities, I, I put the destination in, even if I really know where I'm going, it kind of drives my wife nuts for some reason, but I like to know these things. It's like how far I've got to go, how much progress I've made, how many minutes it's going to be, and, and, and I like to understand how close I am to my destination. See, because this is where this, this begins. Right? When we enter into our GPS, it begins by establishing a destination. That's how I understand how close I am to, to where I'm intending to be. See, when Jesus is teaching us to seek, he's asking us to consider what we have established, what we have set up in our hearts as the destination of our lives. Because destination is ultimately determining direction. Let me say that again. The destination that is central in our pursuit is ultimately determining our direction. So Jesus here, as he's teaching these men and women who've gathered around, who are listening to what he is describing as a life of, of apprenticeship to him, he isn't teaching them to seek something that isn't present. He, he's already announced the arrival of the kingdom of God. That's so much of what the Sermon of the, the Amount is about. It's, it's God's kingdom is here. We're experiencing it in the here and now, but rather Jesus is teaching them, he's instructing them to ultimately make his kingdom the central pursuit of their lives. The, the Greek word here that we translate seek is zadeo. And, and as so often is the case, it, it conveys more than just looking for something. In fact, that word zadeo sometimes is translated as desires or pursues. Um, other places, people translate it as requires or, or demands. So there's this weightiness behind Jesus' words here. He's essentially saying, don't, don't settle for something less than my kingdom. Don't substitute a, a cheap imitation for the real thing. Set the course of your heart, set the destination. Don't set it towards anything other than, than me and what I've come to offer you. Again, the, the, as Matthew is recording Jesus' teaching here, you see this, this progressing line of thinking regarding how we live our lives and and what Jesus teaches us about our pursuits, right? Just earlier in this same chapter, when Jesus is talking about apprenticeship and what this looks like, he teaches on where we store up our treasures, what, what matters, and he talks about how we store up our treasures in heaven. So in verse 19 of the same chapter, Jesus says this, he says, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then, as we already saw, just a few verses after that, Jesus begins to teach on this topic of our concerns and our, our anxiousness, our worries in life. And he, he says in verse 24, or 25, he says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body 
what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? So you begin to understand, you begin to see this, this progression in Jesus' um, teaching to his disciples, to his apprentices. And as he does this, he comes to this, this point of instruction and resolution response to what he said. How do we respond in light of our concerns, our anxieties, or where we're storing up our treasures, and Jesus says, seek. I, I want you to set the central pursuit of your heart to the kingdom, to desire it, to pursue it, to require it and demand it. C.S. Lewis refers to this as the, the principle of first things. And in, in God in the Dock, there's an article that he writes, and he talks about this tendency that we experience in our lives, this this way we have of taking second things, as he talks about them, second priorities, and, and setting them up, replacing them, and making them first priorities. And he talks about how every preference for a good or a small good to a great good or for a partial good to a total good, that's when, we're, that's when we are essentially setting up an inferior thing, a lesser thing in the place of a greater thing. And he writes this, he says, apparently the world is made this way. You can't get second things by putting them first. You can get second things only by putting first things first. Jesus says, seek his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. That, there's a whole nother sermon right there about what, what Jesus means in there. He's not, he's not offering us a, a prosperity gospel, but he is speaking to their, their need for a sense of security and provision and what does that look like and where it comes from. I, I wanna pause here for a moment, if we can, just, just to be introspective for a bit to ask ourselves to wrestle with just a moment of where we have set the destination of our own hearts. What, what is it that you and I are pursuing as first priority? One of the, the occupational hazards of being a pastor and writing sermons and seeking to teach on these things is that Oftentimes when you're working through what this would look like or how to communicate this, the Holy Spirit has this way of just sort of turning and being like, well, what about you? And I'm like, well, let, let's work on what they need first and then we'll. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you this week, was, it was a challenging week for me because it was sort of in the process of this whole thing, the Holy Spirit was just kind of kept coming back to that question. And then coming back to that question, sort of exposing the fact that I had in the whatever course of time sort of allowed second things to creep into that central part of my heart that was directing what I pursue. To, to convict me of that, to expose that in me. And to sort of reveal, to open my eyes to the facts to that, that when you, I, I would say in my case, sort of establishing self there and, and its many facets about what I want and what I need and what this looks like and, and, and how in, in doing that, not only was I missing out on the things that I was trying to prioritize, but I was missing out on him. See, Jesus here, he's teaching us that when we substitute a lesser desire for a greater, we are in fact missing out on both. So he brings us back to the place of first things. He, he teaches us to seek, to make the central pursuit of our hearts, his kingdom and his righteousness. He begs the question, are we ultimately seeking the provider or merely his provision? He teaches us to seek. So that brings us to the second question then. What ultimately then are we seeking? What, what does it mean to say, okay, I'm gonna seek after his kingdom and, and his righteousness? What does this, this look, for, look like? I find, my, I find this happening to me on a, a seeming alarmingly frequent basis, but maybe you've had those moments where you go out to get something and go upstairs, I need this or that or do the other thing, and then you arrive in that location and you cannot recall what you went up there to find, right? 
or, or sometimes my wife will be like, hey, can you go get this for me? And I go to do it and somehow in there, I get completely distracted by something else and I come back and she's like, did you bring me? And I'm like, I did not, I will be right back. You know, like this, this seems to be happening to me, which is one thing when it's happening in the course of our everyday lives, we all do that at some level. It's another thing when that's the condition of my faith. And so Jesus is bringing us back to this point of what we're seeking. I wanna flip over real quickly to the Gospel of John. There's this interesting encounter here that I think is, is instructive. And the context here is, is John is, is writing about the launching of Jesus' meaning, and he's writing about John, the Apostle John is writing about John the Baptist, and he, he records this encounter that, that takes place. This is in verse 35 of chapter one. It says, the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. So that's speaking of John the Baptist. And he says, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? So I'm, I just, I'm gonna pause right there, I'm gonna stop there. Because I, I want us to look at that one question that Jesus asked of these disciples, what, what do you want? Because that, that phrase there is the exact same Greek phrase that we see in Matthew chapter six. It's that same word, Zadeo, what are you seeking? What are you desiring? What are you pursuing? Jesus is asking of them. But what I find fascinating here is that Jesus begins his discipleship process with these two people who are following him at the point of asking what they're pursuing. He, the point of causing them to look inward and consider what they've made the central pursuit of their hearts. See, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been describing in, in no uncertain terms, he's been proclaiming the, the announcement of the arrival of his kingdom. And he's been contrasting it into what things look like in the kingdom of this world. And as he does so, he makes this, he continues to make this connection between the kingdom that he is ushering in and this idea of, of righteousness. In fact, if you look at just the beginning of chapter five, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, you see things like this in verse six, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. A few verses later in verse 10, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And it goes on and on and on like this throughout this teaching. So if this is, if this is such a point of emphasis for Jesus, and, and if this is what he describes to us as this, the object of our seeking, our pursuit, then what exactly does this mean? See, all of this is, is rooted in the, the central purpose of Jesus coming to live a perfect life, submitting himself to a criminal's death, conquering death by resurrecting on the third day his entire purpose of seeking and saving the lost. This is what Jesus describes to us as the means by which we enter into his kingdom. It's, it's what we refer to and talk about as salvation by grace. This is how Jesus teaches us our, our righteousness can surpass that of the Pharisees because his perfection is, is laid on top of us. It, theologically, we say it's imputed to us. It's given to us. It's laid over us. So what Jesus now teaches us is in light of this, because of this, we should pursue, we should set the destination of our hearts to live under the rule and reign of Jesus as our king, to live in, in right relationship with him. See, when we, when we set out to make his kingdom and his righteousness, when we are seeking that, we, we are aligning our lives with his way of doing things. We are submitting to, to life in his kingdom. So when the apostle Paul begins to write to the early church and wants to instruct them on, on how to do life as a follower of Jesus, so much of what he seeks to teach them in the midst of this is what it means 
to live under the rule and reign of Jesus, what this looks like in our life. This is why Paul describes the early church, early followers of Jesus as being citizens of heaven. That your, your citizenship, according to Paul, is not here. You, you live under the rule and reign of a different kingdom, but you reside now in the kingdom of this world. So in Philippians chapter 3, Paul writes and he says, our citizenship is, is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. So Paul is describing this, this, what we talk about as the already and the not yet, right? Our home, this is not our home. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, Paul and, and, is, and Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he's instructing us that this is not the governing authority of our lives. His kingdom is. We're citizens of, of heaven, and yet we reside here in the kingdom of this world. So this is why Jesus says you have to seek it. Because what surrounds you, what you see every day, isn't my kingdom. It's, it's being ushered in, it's coming, and one day it will be here in full. This is why so often in our efforts to follow Jesus, we feel like a foreigner, like we're out of place. But as we do this, as we live under this, he says, submit myself, surrender to the rule and reign of Jesus as king. Live in right relationship with him. So this, this causes us then to ask some questions. Like what, is, what does the rule and reign of Jesus have to say about my work life? What, what, is, what does the rule and reign of Jesus have to say? What, what does it teach us about how I am at home or my marriage or how I parent my kids? What does it have to say about how I use my free time or the way I view entertainment or how I spend my time and my energy and my money? And I mean, it intersects in every area of our lives. For our students here, I know we've got kids with us this morning, whether you're in elementary or, or middle school or high school or college kids, what, what does the rule and reign of Jesus have to say about how we live out our lives at, at school, in lunchrooms, in, in, in gym, on our sports teams, and with our friends, and all of that. This is what Jesus is, is wanting us to process, what he wants us to consider and think about and align our lives with. See, Jesus is teaching us to live out the reality that has already been obtained through salvation. He's teaching us to daily orient our lives towards his kingdom, to seek his righteousness. Which leaves us with that third question, then how do we seek? What, it, what does it look like to seek? And here in this, this last question, I really, I wanna just, if we can, be a bit pragmatic. I just wanna talk practically about some ways that, that I think scripture instructs us, but also just ways of experience this and my own faith journey, ways that, that I think when I, I have lived in alignment, maybe what has led me there. So there's just four things I want us to, to consider as kind of steps in this, if you could. And this is not comprehensive, but just four things to think about. First, I would encourage you to get to know Jesus, which I know sounds, sounds trite or, or easy or whatever. I know like the, the, right, the answer for every pastor is read the Bible. And, and in this case, this is the answer, right? Like, we, if we're going to pattern our lives after someone under his rule and reign, we have to know him. We have to know his story. I love how the Gospel Project refers to the Bible as this unified story that leads us to Jesus. I think that's, that's right. So the more we learn about who he is and what he valued and how he treated people and interacted with people, the more instructed, the more capable we are going to be to, to integrate that into our own experiences. And, and so I would encourage you to spend time knowing his story, knowing him. And we do that, we experience that most comprehensively in the words of scripture. It's, it's, it is telling us the story of Jesus. 
The second thing that I would encourage you with and is, is partner with the Holy Spirit. Partner with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said this in John chapter 14, describing the Holy Spirit. He says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. I think that's so um, instructive to what we're talking about here. He's saying one of the fundamental roles of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to remind you of what I've taught. It's to remind you, it's to align you with my kingdom and, and what I've instructed in terms of how we are to do things. So when, when we position ourselves, when we open up our hearts and our minds to say, okay, Holy Spirit, teach me to listen. Instruct my heart, align my life towards yours. Thirdly, I think it, it, we get brought to a place where we can evaluate, where we can merely just wrestle with, deal with that question. Okay, what what have I established? What have I set up as first priority in my heart and my life? What am I pursuing? And I will, I will tell you on this just because I was dealing with this this week. It was not obvious to me. It was not, I was not in this situation where I was like, I, you know, I'm living an act of rebellion, you know, and I, I it, was, it was subtle. Like, I think this kind of working where, where sort of the Holy Spirit was kind of like, yeah, you've kind of made you the thing that you're going after. I think that this requires some level of, of quiet, honest reflection where we're open to allowing the Holy Spirit to expose things, convict us of things. It's not always pleasant, it's not always easy. I'll tell you my first reaction was to get defensive. It's like, that's not right, you know? Um, and it took some sitting there to say, you know what, that is right. I'm not sure how that happened, I'm not sure why I got there, but it was right. Which brings us to this fourth thing. Um, pray the Lord's Prayer. And again, um, so there's some history in this for me. Because I had discovered that I, I have recited the Lord's Prayer many, many, many times in my life. I've rarely prayed it. Um, and I, I, this winter, I was listening to a sermon and, and somebody was challenging on reciting or, or praying the Lord's Prayer. And I was struck by that phrase. So let's look at it real quick. This is back in, in Matthew chapter 6. When Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, he says this. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That, that phrase in the middle of there, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I, I started to, to pray this every morning. When I would wake up, okay, Lord, today in my life, your kingdom come, your will be done. And I'll tell you, it, it, it started to transform, change the way I approach my day. And I'm not even sure, I, don't, I haven't been doing that. I'm not sure when that stopped or why it was earlier this winter. I was doing that consistently and then all of a sudden, I'm not. And, and I'll, but I'll tell you that when I was, when I was praying this regularly, it changed the way I approached my day. And I would focus just on that little portion of the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Today, here, Lord, in me, in my life, and through my life, Lord, do this in me. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So this morning, as we wrap up, I want to, I want to challenge you. As we've talked about each week, we've tried to give you a, a way to experience each of these disciplines. And this week, I, I, I want to ask two things of you. First, just set aside some time for that process of evaluation. Set, even today, just set aside a little time to be quiet and to be still and just ask God to, to um, allow you to see kind of that, that section of your heart. Um, it, it may be great. It may be something that he really affirms the direction that you're in. It, it may be convicting and challenging, but start there. But then each day this week, begin your day with a simple prayer. 
Begin your day by, by praying that portion. Pray the whole Lord's Prayer, but, but emphasize that portion. Your kingdom come, your will be done today in and through my life. Lord, do this in me. And let's together practice this, this discipline of seeking, of seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity just to come into your word and to be challenged by Jesus' instruction to these, these men and women and to the church about what it means to live as his apprentice. And so God, as we wrestle with this and as we think about this, Lord, I pray that this week that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, establish the destination of our hearts towards you and towards what you want to do. So Lord, where we're kicking back, Lord, bring us to a place of surrender. Lord, where we're just misguided, lead us to truth. And ultimately, Lord, may the direction of our lives be set towards your kingdom and your righteousness. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.